Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us on the WebEx today. Please ask any questions in the Q&A pane, and they will be answered accordingly. To download today's deck, please click on the box link, which can be found in the greeting message you receive when you join the call. Please do stay on at when you disconnect the event today and go ahead and answer a few survey questions for us. And with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank you for joining the IBM I and ISV's call session today. At this time, I'd like to introduce Gina King. Go ahead, Gina. Thank you very much, Jean. I am going to keep this brief today. I think I've met um, many of you on previous webcasts. I have responsibility for our ISV partner ecosystem. Uh, usually we do a pretty lengthy kickoff for these calls, but because we have some really uh, incredible and lots of material to cover uh, with regard to what's new in, in, in IBMI and, and loads of resources for our ISV partners, we're just gonna jump right in. So with that, I'd like to introduce our, our three um, presenters today. Steve Will, who I think you all know is our Chief Architect for IBMI. Alison Butterall, who I know you've all heard from before as well, um, who is a program, our Program Director and, and Lead for Offering Management for IBMI. And Brandon Peterson, who runs our Product Marketing for IBMI, as well as the Scale-Out System. So with that, let me go ahead and turn it over to Steve, and uh, we hope you enjoy today's session. Thanks, everybody. This is going to be a joint session, so we're going to be uh, all of us presenting at once, and I would like to let Allison talk about the business before I get into the strategy and roadmap. Thanks, Steve. So, yes, um, the business of IBMI. Until about uh, the end of February, this was an incredibly um, good-looking year. And then just as it hit all of our businesses across the world, of course, COVID hit in March and things changed dramatically. However, I did want to tell you a little bit about our IBMI business and where we sit today. So until the end of February, um, we were, as I said, very optimistic about the year. We do business in 117 countries around the world. Some of you may be from various different countries. We support over 60 national languages and that's as primary languages, but we also support approximately another 30 something for secondary languages as well. Our clients range in all sizes from some of the largest companies in the world, some of the largest banks in the world, right down to very small companies with, you know, a few employees, three, five employees. We cover all industries as you would expect with IBM I. Many of you who are attending have been around in this industry as long as we have with IBMI and before that the AS400. Um, so you know that our heritage has always been in the manufacturing distribution sector. But over the last 10 to 15 years, we have seen incredible growth in the financial sector and retail. Now that's not to say that manufacturing and distribution have fallen off, absolutely not we see incredible growth across the board and we support multiple industries. Part of that industry support is what all of you help us with in providing business applications to our um, customers. And so we, we are excited to be able to reconnect with some of you, get some of our team more educated in some of the industries that you're in. It's one of the things that we find we need to do specifically um, with our IBM team and some of our hardware business partners is educate them in industry information. So we really appreciate that chance. Now, very quickly, as I said, um, that covers our business up until the end of February. We were looking very optimistically at a great year and um, starting at the beginning of March, of course, our business fell off just as all of yours did. But what was interesting to us is the number of companies that were able to smoothly transition from you know, using their uh, laptops at the office to taking them home and connecting remotely. And we have a number of client stories. We'll talk a little bit about that um, towards the end of the presentation, but number of clients that were able to move quickly to a remote environment. On top of that, we saw, of course, um, businesses changed and we saw tremendous growth in um, and usage of systems in companies like um, healthcare and insurance as all of those claims were being processed as people were afflicted with COVID. And then the other thing that was interesting and 
probably a little unexpected, at least for my part, was the growth in usage of companies that support telco um, kinds of environments as people were upgrading their home internet capabilities, as you would expect, as they have multiple people in their home all heads down on, on machines all day long. So we saw interesting balance of, um, while some companies were doing, uh, you know, what we're scaling back, especially in the small businesses, we are also seeing some of our larger clients grow even more. So a very interesting um, um, diversity across what we were seeing. So that's enough of me talking about the business. If you have specific questions, I'm happy to answer those. Um, you can enter them into the questions panel. And with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to Steve, and he's going to walk us through a little bit about what's the, the latest technologies with IBM I. So, Steve? Thanks, okay. Allison. So, part of uh, what we wanted to do as we connect with you as our ISVs is to give you kind of the background information that we all need to have in mind. What is IBM I's strategy? What's our roadmap? What, are we, what have we been doing? That's what I'm going to cover. And then when we get to the latter part of the presentation, things that are more specifically of use to you in your ISV business related to IBMI. So I'll start with the more roadmap and technical stuff. But as Allison already uh, inferred, replied here, we, we have probably all been on this platform for a long time. Now, some of you may have come in a little later than I did, um, but this platform has a long heritage. And that heritage has allowed us to uh, do a lot of great business, a lot of great technology with clients throughout the years. It's also caused some confusion as names have changed sometimes. But now we've been IBM I on power systems for more than 12 years. In fact, I marked it with a blog earlier this summer. We have now been IBM I on power systems longer than the AS400 was in market. So, this heritage that we have comes with a great deal of power. And as you know, our client base is very, very passionate about the platform. There are some key things that have made that passion be uh, well-deserved. And a lot of that relates to the strategy that we have in how we deal with you as uh, solution vendors and tool vendors, how we relate to our clients, and the strategy and the technology that we use to get there. We have had, since the very beginning, an architecture for this operating system, which is not just another Unix variant. And it's not uh, Windows, which is a, you know, a little operating system that grew. From the beginning, this was designed to be a platform that would be for business solutions to run on. So our integrated database that is part of the architecture of the platform, you don't have to add to it, you don't have to update it, you don't have to manage it is all part of this platform. You take advantage of it just as our clients do. The object-based architecture is one of many parts of IBM I that protects clients from things like Trojan horses and viruses that plague other operating systems, and it's built into the operating system. Of course, there can be security tools and so on built on top of that, but that basic architecture protects in ways that doesn't happen on other platforms. We have had virtualized work management, our subsystem architecture since the very beginning that has allowed you as a tool or a solution vendor to have multiple different things running next to a client's workload or as the client's main workload and have another copy and another copy and another copy if you wanted to, for example, do a software as a service environment. We integrate the technology that all of you are going to need, at least the core technology that we believe is pervasive we needed throughout our solution and tool vendors. Okay, and then we have this thing called the technology independent machine interface, with no, which no other architecture has. You've taken advantage of it. Clients have taken advantage of it, and it's a double-edged sword. People can compile code, could have compiled code in 1988, and never recompiled it, and it still runs today. No other platform has an architecture that can do that. But of course, that means that many clients have code that they haven't really updated in a long time. And that can present some kinds of challenges, but it certainly provides business value. And that architecture is part of the reason that this heritage has been able to continue throughout the years. But another part of how we do business uh, applies to that heritage and the passion that our clients see. And that is the input that we get from our community. We have a lot of different ways that we get input on what we should do next on this platform. 
we have, as many of you have probably heard, the large users group, about 100 of the largest companies in the world. Some of you probably have your products in those large companies, so you know the kind of people we're talking about. They push us to make sure that we are as scalable as we possibly could be, while as being also as reliable and securable as possible. Then there's Common and Common Europe and the similar organizations around the world, including in Japan, where our small and medium business clients help us to stay on track with being as usable as we possibly can, so that we can be as automated as we possibly can, so they don't have to devent, uh, devote a lot of technical resources to running their platform, which you also help with. Then we have an ISV Advisory Council. We actually met with them last week to show them where we're headed as a platform and, and get some input from them on some things that we want, and so on. We have all of these different ways. In fact, we have these client uh, and customer briefing and planning sessions that we can do. Now, right now, we can't do them on site in Rochester and Montpellier, but uh, when we're back to sort of normal, we'll be able to do it again. And we take advantage of that a lot. And by the way, that has uh, resulted in our client base giving us a net promoter score. Many of you are probably familiar with net promoter scores. You know, would you recommend this company? Uh, of 81, which is one of the highest in the whole IBM corporation. So we are happy to see that our strategy of engaging with clients on our direction has really helped not only keep their passion up, but also keep their satisfaction up. And we also try to gauge what the market needs by working with people to create uh, surveys. And Help Systems, six or seven years ago, started doing surveys every year about uh, all the different aspects of IBM I usage in the marketplace. One of the key questions they always ask is what your top concerns are, and we pay attention to that. If you look at those top four, security, high availability, modernizing applications, and IBM I skills, by which our clients tend to mean, am I going to be able to get the skills I need for IBM I? Those four things have been the top four in some order or another for the past several years, but there's even been some growth in those top four. Even though we are the most securable system in the world, there has been growth in terms of how much concern, how much focus an IT executive has on security because it's just so critical to running a business these days. So it went up from 67 to 77 over the course of the last year. Uh, high availability and disaster recovery is more important to more customers. It used to be that small customers thought they were fine with if they were out for two days or so while they restored their system, if something happened, that'd be fine. That's almost not non-existent anymore, even in our small clients. And there are a couple things on the on the right hand side which are worth noting. Uh, migrating applications to the cloud has become a, a concern of about a quarter of our client base. That's not 80%, but it's growing uh, quite a bit. It's about 50% uh, more than it was the year before. And finally, we've got some folks who've been paying attention to what many of our clients have been doing with AI, and they're starting to look at that same thing. So as we look at these top concerns, as we take the feedback that our clients have been giving, what do we do with that? Well, we factor it into our strategy. Our strategy has always been based on, number one, we are a solutions platform on the power system. So we need to enable our clients and our ISVs to get value out of the power system, but also to get value out of the latest technologies. But from the point of view, not of the technology, but of the value that it brings to the business that they're running, and that means the business solution that they're running their business on. To do that, we got to give them choices. We are not going to dictate to anybody how to get there. And I, I want you as ISVs to truly understand this. There is no one way that we're trying to tell our clients or you to develop solutions on the platform. We are providing you lots of opportunity. We're modernizing how we do RPG. We're also providing uh, open technology so that you have choices on how to get there. And by the way, these days, one of those choices are, is uh, do I want to run everything in my own shop? Do I want to run everything in a cloud or managed environment? Or do I want to have a hybrid? Whatever choice makes sense for a client, that's what we want to enable. But whatever we do with those top two things, we're going to integrate things so that it becomes simple, so that it becomes a low total cost of ownership machine that is easily securable and very reliable. That's the strategy, and it has been for years. So what are we doing with that strategy? Well, if you look at the cornerstones, the most recent major release that we have uh, produced came out in the spring of last year, the 7.4 release. And our cornerstone line items, the things that we uh, touted as the big deal 
uh, in 7-4 were around those top four concerns. Availability was the second concern on that list. Security was the number one concern. And we had major enhancements in 7-4 around both of those, as well as open source technology, which not only helps clients modernize applications, which was number three on the list, but allows them to bring in new skills who know open source from just the outside world, not specifically on IBM I, because that open source stuff works just as well on IBM I in just the same way on IBM I as it does in the rest of the world. And so that addresses the skills needs as well. And we want you to understand that's our strategy. That's what we're trying to do. If you've been wondering, oh, I've got all this RPG code, can I supplement it with something from open source? Yes. Look at the open source technologies that other people on IBM I are, are working with. Uh, look at the ones that we are specifically contributing to, and you can know that we are behind those uh, technologies strategically. So we produce this stuff, as you probably well know, with major releases. But I also hope that you are well aware of the fact that while we do have a major new release every three years or so, or so and we are continuously working on the next major releases at all times, we're also doing twice a year technology refreshes that gather up the requests that clients have made to us that we can fit before another major release, and we put them out. So yes, it takes a little more to stay up to date than it did back in the 90s when we would basically just drop a release every two or four years, and that was all we did. But on the other hand, you can adopt new technology much more quickly, and it shows our clients a continuous drumbeat of new innovation that's available and possible on IBM I. And that continuous drumbeat should make them feel um, confident that there's going to continue to be new enhancements from IBM I into the future. Now, this version that I showed you first, that's the version we show people. You can show people this version if you want, but really it's just a version to show you there's a lot going on. We are continuously doing these new things. We're also continuously dropping these technology refreshes often driven by power technology, IO technology, but incorporating things like open source database enhancements, uh, access client solutions, and so on. The kinds of things that we do in those technology refreshes can be seen in uh, just a brief overview of what we did in technology refresh 2 for 7.4 and the accompanying TR8 for 7.3. We had enhancements there for high availability and disaster recovery, in particular bringing our DD2 mirror product uh, capabilities that help it get down into the small, medium business space. We always have enhancements related to db 2 for i particularly the SQL services, which I hope all of you are aware of because they are essentially a, an open API into managing the platform and getting data about the platform so you don't have to code to specific IBM I APIs. Um, increasing the productivity of developers and administrators, doing open source enhancements. Again, those kinds of things are announced twice a year to coincide with our technology refreshes. So there's nothing specific here that you need to do specifically, but I want you to be aware that there are things uh, coming out twice a year in all of these categories. And if there's something specific that you're waiting for, ask us. Ask us if we're about to do something. We can see what we can do. Now, the biggest thing that we did in 7.4 was to produce a product, a, a product that sits on top of 7.4 that allows clients to do continuous availability. This is in a single data center pairing two systems so that their applications can be running on that pair of systems with zero downtime, even if they need to do an update to one of those physical systems. This does not replace the need for disaster recovery you still have to have that. This is about making your single data center, your single IBM I, building it out of two systems so that you can, for example, install PTFs on one of the systems or upgrade the release on one of the systems and keep your workload running at the same time. Now, sometimes as a solution may need to have small changes in it to take advantage of the uh, possibility of running on two systems at one time. If you're interested in running in this environment, and we think you ought to be, you're going to want to uh, get some education from us on how to evaluate your application to do exactly that. That's not what we're here to tell you about, though. That's a whole presentation on its own. Um, I just want you to be aware it's there. 
If you want to find out what we've been doing, if you want to go to the Technology Updates Wiki, this replaced DeveloperWorks. As some of you are probably aware, you've followed DeveloperWorks for our updates for years. Uh, that went away. Now we're all doing it somewhere else. But this is a nice landing page for all the places that are all the things that we do uh, with each of our technology updates. And we have updates that are associated with our uh, products as well. There was a recent uh, change to uh, web query, providing new additions. So those things also come out on this base, on this semi-annual basis, and we talk about those on our websites as well. And so now this architecture, this architecture that started back in the days of the AS400 has evolved over time to incorporate more advanced technology. We can do more with our database than ever before. Our integration includes integrating with cloud so that we can have a hybrid environment if we want to. It includes having virtualization that's not just built into subsystems, but is also built into virtual machines on power. And of course, you can take advantage of a lot of the capabilities that are on the power platform. So one other viewpoint of this plat of this uh, roadmap that everybody ought to have is how long into the future IBM is publishing our roadmap. The prior roadmap didn't have dates on it. This one does, and it shows that uh, our 7.4 release is going to live for about seven years. That's what that dark color means. And then after that, the next releases are going to live seven years on their own, which puts us out into the 2030s. Most of our clients just want to be reassured that they're not making a bad decision by continuing to recommit to IBM I. This sort of roadmap plus the technology we've talked about helps. Now, of course, to get there, we're going to have to have uh, applications that are uh, modern and taking advantage of the modern way that people write code and consume services these days. And for many of our clients or you as a solution vendor, that means refactoring to retain the value of it critical uh, business processes that you have written in the past, but also then extending to be able to do things like mobile, to be able to do things like graphical interfaces and graphing of data, to be able to connect to the cloud and so on. All of that is necessary. And that has been one of the key drivers of our business over the past several years. Now we have loads of client examples. I'm just talking about this particular one, but Formaserve in the United Kingdom, for example, had to respond to a change in the tax laws in the UK. And to do that, they took the core code that they had in RPG, which had been modernized and modularized, and they extended that with open source where they could easily get modules that could interact with the government's services-based reporting of those taxes. It's a nice story to show how our ability to write applications, modernize applications using multiple technologies can solve true real-world business problems without everybody having to say, oh, I guess you'll have to re-implement that. Of course you won't. You can do that today on IBM I because we give you choices. This is the second part of that strategy that I talked about earlier. You have your traditional languages and environments which continue to get updates to make them easier and easier for clients to use. But then you also have these open technologies that allow clients to take advantage of the services that are available or the language capabilities that do services or mobile or web or whatever so much easier on these newer languages. And that gives us the opportunity to ask clients, how have you been using that? And we have, as I mentioned, story after story after story of clients doing exactly that. These four stories represented here are laid out in detail in our client stories page, which Brandon will point out to you in a few charts. But in this, you've got robotics happening on the top left in a wood shop, uh, in a wood based shop where they build things using a robotics line, all driven by IBM I. You've got uh, a company that helps run um, schools in Japan who have a, a chat bot that can answer students' questions that get texted to it, and it's running on IBM I, and all without any human intervention because it's a chatbot. It's a, a machine language learning thing that can handle this, okay? Um, and then more 3D open source simulation on the lower, uh, on the lower left um, that's running Yori, where they do 3D simulation of furniture before it ever gets built all on IBM I and gets fed into the line. Or on the bottom right, 
there is a nursery, a, a very big nursery that sells uh, sells flowers to hundreds and hundreds of locations around the United States, all being driven by IBMI. So this is not just something new that maybe you can do. It's being used by hundreds of clients around the world. And one of the biggest things that's happening in the world today, and as I mentioned, about 25% of our clients are looking at how are we going to do things in the cloud. And we have a lot of different ways IBMI is being used in the cloud today. These are some of those pillars, how people are doing it. First of all, software as a service. Some of you probably have IBMI running your software as a service for your clients. It makes perfect sense. We have a lot of different managed service providers who provide infrastructure as a service so that people can just host their machines within their environments. Perfectly valid way to do things. There are also what are typically called public cloud providers. People like SkyTap and Google who have power systems in their environments and can run IBMI. And of course, IBM as a public cloud provider can do the same. So you can run IBMI in that power virtual server that's part of the IBM cloud. We create that as a, a, an infrastructure as a service, so you can go in via a customer portal and you can get a little IBMI partition to do a little development in, for example, or you can get a big one and move part of your uh, workload there. So that's all part of what's available to our client base these days. The key use cases, in fact, for IBMI in that power systems cloud are testing, so that you don't have to have a specific test machine. Clients are paying for little partitions to be able to do, part do their tests or a part of or all of their production, or having a disaster recovery space so that in case they need it, they have a way to go and get it in the cloud. So all of that is available today. So now I'm gonna let Allison do a little summary and then move us, transition us into the next section. Wonderful, thanks, Steve. Um, so just to summarize, I think, um, Steve has covered all of the highlights, and certainly, as he said, many of you have been with us for um, the, the third, over 30 years that we, we've been involved as well. But I think um, we often tend to think about our application in just a traditional environment. And what we're really um, all about right now on IBM I is really expanding those options or those environments. But let's start with our native solutions. And, I'm sure some of you will recognize your um, company in here. We have so many thousands of solutions. I just put a few into my chart here, but I really wanted to talk a little bit about the native solutions written in RPG, COBOL, Java perhaps, accessing DB2 for I, and using, in some cases, Apache to talk to other environments, but running on I on a power system. For many of our clients, this is what they require. This is what they use, and we certainly know um, that this is all of the ways that we um, have applications being generated. And as I said, many of you have been with us a long time. But some of our clients are looking at additional solutions or integration of solutions. Or as all of you are aware, RPG does not do or does not produce the user interface of today. And in that case, many of our clients are looking for things like open source. And Steve mentioned a few of those like Yori, for example, or, um, or, or the company in Japan that has built, it, uh, built the front end down on mobile devices. This is a really important concept to be able to integrate these open source, um, open source environments on IBM I to be able to work with native solutions and extend beyond what you expected. Even moving to things that Steve mentioned about the internet of things, and open source is often the way to do that. Um, many, many, IoT devices code their or their they operate their systems using Python. So it's great that we can talk Python to Python. If that doesn't solve the problem for you as you're helping your clients um, to be able to move into something like an AIX or a Linux partition, you could spin up one of those on the same power hardware where your client is running their application. And you can have the client integrate some of the other pieces of code that they might have acquired or might be writing um, on a Linux uh, partition, for example. So things like H2O, um, if this is deep analytics that you're building into your application to send out to your clients, H2O can run their um, machine learning or building of the model in a Linux solution. And you can actually move the final runtime engine 
or model into a Java environment running in the IFS on IBM I. So it runs very close to the data. So again, various different solutions that are available. If that doesn't solve the, the questions that your clients have that you need to you know, build into your application solution, then maybe you can talk to the cloud. Um, the example I have here obviously is IBM's cloud because Watson runs there and we certainly have a lot of different options on Watson, about 50 different kinds of paradigms, everything from analyzing tone in notes right through to providing weather forecasts and being able to build that into logistics applications is really critical. So those are the kinds of things that you could get in the cloud and you can extend your business application out to cloud solutions and it would really help in being able to um, uh, provide those total business solutions to those clients. Or perhaps you're going to run um, applications that build in some other form of artificial intelligence. Certainly H2O is one of our partners, but so are um, AngularJ, for example, or TensorFlow. TensorFlow, of course, doing visual recognition, and we have a number of companies um, through Europe who are building in TensorFlow applications to um, do video recognition or facial recognition um, and, and looking for possible fraud instances in various different environments. Pretty cool technology. And it all feeds it back into um, applications that are running on IBM I. So again, IBM I native solutions written in RPG, COBOL, Java, able to talk to these other advanced technologies like visual recognition through cameras, through video clips, or doing deep in analytics the way H2O does, or using some of the gaming techniques that AngularJ puts in. I mean, all of these are very cool technologies, and all you're doing is extending the value that you're providing to the customers today. And all of that, as Steve mentioned, is in the cloud. The entire environment works in the cloud. It's important to know that because many of your clients may decide to move to the cloud with little or no uh, um, changes to the application, they should be able to do that. If you have a cloud, you probably are already familiar with the fact that IBM I runs almost untouched. You can move it from an on-prem environment to a cloud environment and we accommodate that very well. Um, but it's the same whether you're running native solutions, open source, whether you're integrating with AIX or Linux, whether you're reaching out to Watson in the cloud, whether you're requiring on-prem solutions, all of, uh, sorry, um, on system solutions with things like H2O, all of that runs in the cloud environments. And we certainly have lots of cloud environments for you to choose from. Um, of course, the one Steve talked about is the IBM Power Systems the virtual servers. We have those available um, as well. So if you are looking for a solution, let us know. Send an email. We are happy to connect you with the various groups in IBM that can help you with cloud solutions. The last thing I wanted to quickly touch on, and we had many questions about this, um, is Ansible and IBM I. And Steve and I have spent some time doing a lot of um, research into Ansible, and Steve's team, both in Rochester and in China, have spent quite a bit of time in working with Ansible and how it integrates with IBM I. Um, Steve mentioned it a little bit, but you know, it's a wonderful environment for doing things like code distribution. And when I say code distribution, not just for DevOps environment for development, but also for systems management. As you are distributing PTFs, for example, as you're distributing or managing a network of systems, you can create these playbooks or scripts that you can send around through your network. And Ansible is a wonderful way of doing that. Ansible through um, playbooks are able to um, check on the, on the validity of actually distributing the, distributing the various pieces of code. It can check on whether it made it there. It checks on certain environmental conditions and decides whether to apply um, changes or not. It's a wonderful vehicle for distributing code. And we are looking at that quite intently. In fact, some of our ISVs are looking at um, how they integrate Ansible into their actual code, specifically around the idea of distributing code. Now, there are lots of other things that Ansible is capable of doing, um, but that was just the simplest one for me to be able to explain the 
um, workflow automation is probably one that we all understand quite easily. So as Steve mentioned, we have lots of stories and I'm not going to um, take away from Brandon's time of talking through all the different things that are available for ISVs from an IBM I perspective, but I did want to mention just a couple of things. We think about IBM I as really the innovation area. Um, you know, for a couple of years, we have had things like um, IBM I equals innovation. We had the system by innovators for innovators. We had 30 years of innovation and we're just getting started. All of these were really, um, really accolades to our entire community. So if I look at these stories, for example, in the top left corner, this is the Norwegian Air Ambulance and their ability to use weather, um, weather devices, weather monitors around through the northern parts of uh, Norway to track weather fronts and um, to know whether when it's safe for people to go in an air ambulance to pick up um, injured or sick people from various remote parts of Norway. Or on the right hand side, the company in Italy who um, has had two major breakthroughs with using Alexa as a front end to the application. They are able to have a conversation with Alexa from the shop floor and people don't have to touch screens. They simply trigger Alexa to operate and they tell Alexa what to update. Um, but also in their company, as they try to look at booking appointments with executives and other personnel within the staff, they are able to do that through Alexa as well. So a couple of different ways they're using modern technology and it's all running the back end on IBM I. We have um, a company in Belgium that does the tracking and distribution of wine and they've interfaced their IBM I applications, inventory control and order, um, order and entry capabilities with blockchain. So they're able to track the wine from the time the grapes are picked off the vine until they appear in a grocery store or in a restaurant. And they know exactly um, where those models have gone. So if there was ever any um, uh, problem with uh, bacteria in the wine or in the in the batch or the shipment of wine, they're able to track it. And then of course the mobile devices that are now so capable of access from anywhere. And in this case, it's a, um, a person sitting in a truck and they've put mobile devices in all the trucks and they're able to update on the fly what they're delivering, where they're delivering and mapping out the most efficient routes between various locations. So fabulous innovation that our clients and our ISVs are developing. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brandon. And Brandon, I'm going to let you walk um, everybody through exactly what um, what working with IBM these days is all about and what is available to all of our ISVs to use. So Brandon, I'll let you take it over. Perfect. Thank you so much, Allison. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. As Allison introduced me, I am a product marketing manager for IBM I and the IBM I portfolio, as well as scale out power systems portfolio, so excited to talk to our ISV community today. So <clears throat> some of you have probably heard from myself or the IBM I team. Uh, myself and the team have been working extensively this year to reach back out and reconnect with a lot of our ISV community who maybe haven't heard from us in a while. So uh, if I've connected with you so far, uh, I'm glad to do so and uh, looking forward to connecting with many more of you this year. So I'm just going to go over, as Allison mentioned, some ways that uh, we can work together, opportunities uh, that are available to you as an ISV to help your business and, uh, and drive more revenue. So first, let's start with some marketing resources that hopefully you all are familiar with, but in case, uh, make sure to bookmark these. First and foremost, this is our IBMI landing page. I hope you're familiar with this page. If not, the link is right there at the bottom of the slide. Definitely bookmark it. This is your one-stop shop for everything related to IBM I. We just did a refresh of this page with brand new as of this past Friday. So if you haven't gone back out to check it out in a while, definitely do that. Um, but everything you need to know about IBM I can be found here or linked to from this page. This is our IBM I white paper. This is also on the front page of the IBM I homepage. Uh, this is our future strategy and direction and roadmap for IBM I and the IBM I portfolio. Uh, Alice and Steve work on this together and update it on a regular basis. I work with them as well. Uh, so definitely go to the, our landing page, download this, share it with your team, your management, 
this is everything you need to know about our strategy and, and future roadmap for the platform. And again, the link is there at the bottom of the slide. So this is our customer story page. Allison and Steve talked about a few of these already. Uh, link is there at the bottom of the slide. We have over 60 client stories on this page. I know because I've written all of them myself, so I hope, I hope you like them. But uh, we have a variety of customers from all different kinds of industries uh, from all over the world. I think we have at least several from every continent in the world other than Antarctica. So we'll work on that next. But uh, definitely go check these out. That you can find uh, a client in your region of the world, in your industry, I guarantee it. Uh, but our ask for you is we want to hear from your customers. So if you have a customer who would be willing and interested to participate in a story with us, please reach out to me and send them my way. Uh, it's very simple uh, and it's very beneficial for both your business and our business. Uh, and many of these stories, if you go and read them, we talk about how the client is using their IVMI to drive business value on the IVMI platform. So we'll talk about how they're using your solution as well as IVMI on power. Uh, so please bring those, your customers to us and we'll get them written up. But the only item required of you and your client is one phone call with myself and review of the story. That's it. So very, very painless, but very beneficial to your business. So let me actually talk about one of these. So this is, we just published, this is our latest customer story we published. And this is a company called Albert Jagger. Uh, they're based in the United Kingdom. They supply materials to the vehicle and boat building industry in the United Kingdom. And Albert Jagger found himself, just like we all have this year, in the situation where United Kingdom went to lockdown early this year in the spring, and the team had to pick up and move home to continue working. So, but because they run their business on the IBMI platform, there was no disruption to their business. Uh, their team was able to take their laptop home, plug in at home, connect to the power system back to the office, and continue business as usual. Uh, and actually, since they run on IBMI, the team was able to get back to the workplace safely two to four weeks earlier than expected, which was a key competitive advantage for them. So uh, remote work in IBMI uh, is the best platform to be on for this time. So here's another one, and Steve talked about some innovation. Steve and Allison talked about some innovation happening in, in the IBMI community, and this is certainly one of them. This is a company called k and Trucking, based here in the Midwest United States. Uh, they're, uh, they run about 100 trucks, um, mainly focusing on refrigerated cargo, such as food, uh, and they've been able to use IoT and cloud technology on the IBMI platform to greatly benefit their business. So in every truck, in every trailer, there is a device that monitors temperature and, and other things, and that data from that device is sent back to the Power9 system back at their office running IBMI, and there's, let's say, the temperature gets too hot, uh, they'll get a notification, the driver will get notified, they can pull over and make that correction before the cargo goes bad. So, uh, great example of IoT technology with IBMI. Also, uh, twice a day, they send all their trucking data up to a, a cloud solution, a SaaS solution, and that's then analyzed and a report is sent back, sent back to help them streamline their operations. So, a really great story of, of innovation on the IBMI platform. And also, hope you've seen this. This is our IDC blog. Uh, it was published last year, shortly after the end of IBMI 7.4. Uh, if you just Google this, it'll come up, but also the link there at the bottom of the, of the slide. Uh, Peter Rutten is an uh, analyst for IDC. Uh, IDC is one of the, the big three uh, consultants, analysts. Uh, but they wrote an article about how IBMI is basically the driverless variant of IT infrastructure. And that's even more critical now. This was written before COVID, and that's come true uh, more important even this year than it was last year. And, you know, Albert Jagger and other customers uh, proved that to be true. So definitely go check this blog out and share it with your network. And also IDC wrote a report for us as well about the value of staying current both on your software and hardware. Uh, so this is a more in-depth report. It's about four to five pages long. Uh, it's also on the front page of the, the IBMI landing page. Uh, so definitely go check that out as well and, and share that with your team and your management. Now this is another report, Gartner, another big analyst firm. Uh, they wrote this report for us and we didn't 
we, did, we earned this report. I want to make this very clear to everyone on the call, is we did not pay for this report to be written. Uh, but they wrote a report about how uh, the risk of leaving, uh, and I, I hate using this word, I will hate using this word, but legacy IBM platforms, uh, not just IBM I, but AIX and Z as well. Uh, but they wrote an in-depth report about the, the risks of leaving these platforms and uh, the cost savings that many people think they'll get by leaving going to a public cloud environment or whatever it is uh, are actually often not true. Um, and performance will suffer. So definitely, uh, I think if you go to this report, to this link, it may ask you to pay uh, for this report, but uh, we just renewed our license to it. So if you want a copy, please email me and I'll get that for you. Okay, also hopefully you saw this last year. This was at Think, and this is a really awesome article. eWeek is a, a popular tech online publication. Uh, Rob Enderley, interviewed uh, Allison, I think Steve as well, when we were in, or maybe just Allison, it's <laughs> a long time ago, but uh, when we were in San Francisco for the Think 2019 conference and interviewed her about, you know, IBM I and our future roadmap and strategy. And uh, the next day published this article, <laughs> which we were all pleasantly surprised with. Uh, the most amazing IBM product you never heard of. I know we have a lot of work to do, I guess, on the marketing side so more, more people can hear about it. but. You all know about it, and uh, so it's great to get some some awesome coverage for the IBM I platform and call it a mainstream uh, tech publication. So I don't think we have the link on this slide, but if you just Google it, you can still find it. Go out, check it out, and share with your network. So I want to go over some resources that are available to you as an ISV. Uh, first is our uh, the IBM Garage. Now you may be wondering what the IBM Garage is. Basically, this is what we used to call the client briefing centers or the executive briefing centers. Uh, so there's a lot of services under the IBM garage umbrella, but one of these is our, what we're now calling the IBM systems cloud for enablement and co-creation. Basically what that is, is it also used to be known as the power development cloud. You may be familiar with that. Uh, but basically what you can do on this cloud is get space for, get an IBM I partition on Power9 or actually we still have Power8 in that cloud uh, to test uh, to develop and to certify your software solution. So if you haven't certified your uh, solution on the latest release of IBM I and Power 9 yet, you can do, the, do that on this cloud. And the link there is at the bottom of the slide to get more information. And uh, just a little bit more about the IBM Garage. Um, this is the second, the bottom half of that page. Uh, you can register your solution in the global solution directory if you haven't done that already. Uh, you can join Partner World, set up a Partner World account if you haven't done that already either. Uh, so just some, some more resources uh, that are available to you. So definitely bookmark this page as well. This will be a key resource as an ISV. Uh, yeah, this is the Client Experience Center that I mentioned. These are now called the IBM Garage for Systems. So we just uh, renamed them. But uh, I wanted to point out on this call that these are available to you as an ISV. You know, many of you may have come in for a briefing with us from, from IBM, but as an ISV, we allow you to host your own briefing for your own clients at our briefing centers. And I'm going to go over how you can do that here, but I want to let you know that's also available to you as an ISV. Uh, something we can host for you is a co-creation workshop. Uh, we've done this with several ISVs already. Uh, if you can get some time with uh, us, our technical team, to uh, work together to solve a business challenge, to uh, make an improvement to your software solution, whatever you need. Uh, but we can set up and host a co-creation workshop where we work together with you uh, to achieve whatever, whatever you need for your business. So this is available as well. And this is, yeah, just something we've done. We can do a proof of technology for DB2 Mirror, which is our uh, active active high availability solutions. Uh, this is the Rochester Executive Briefing Center. We also have one in Austin, but this is the main one for IBM. Our IBM I team is located. Uh, again, you can host a, we can host a co-creation workshop for you there in Rochester. Uh, hopefully back, we can do that back in person next year, but right now we can do them virtually if you're interested in that. Uh, and you can submit a request right there. The link is right there if, if you're interested in, in doing that. And uh, for those of you located in Europe, we also have an executive briefing center in Montpellier with an extensive IBM I team there as well. Uh, and I will say the IBM I team there is uh, 
very proficient in new technologies, uh, AI, cloud, IoT, Ansible. Um, so if you're based in Europe and want to learn more about those, definitely the Montpelier Center is the place to be. Um, same thing in Rochester, we can offer the co-creation workshop, uh, both in, hopefully in person soon, but right now vir uh, virtually as well if you're interested. And again, the link is there at the bottom of the slide. Okay, so I mentioned this uh, a couple slides ago, but you know, as an ISV, please remember that you are able, you have the ability to host a briefing for your clients in our briefing centers. We'd be happy to help you get that set up for you. So uh, the only charge uh, for an in-person briefing would be there's a small charge for the, the staff working and for the catering, uh, but that's it. We don't charge for the, to, to use the actual space or for audio visual or anything like that. Uh, just a small fee for the catering, but uh, if you are interested in setting up a briefing for your clients, uh, and we can get you know the IBMI team to to come in and present as well. But uh, if this is something you're interested in. Definitely, it's available to you. Uh, and it's available in any location, by the way, not just in Montpelier and Rochester. That's where many of the the IBMI team is based. Uh, but we can do this in Austin and uh, other places as well. Uh, but right now, many of them are being done virtually. Now, uh, there is no cost uh, to do a virtual briefing. Uh, we assume that you, you will just eat your, own <laughs> eat your own food at home and drink your own coffee, so there's no cost. Uh, this can be done at any location, and uh, so we'd be happy to set up a, a virtual briefing for you as well, if that's something you're interested in doing, before we can get back to meeting in person. So I'm in Partner World. Hopefully you're familiar with Partner World. Hopefully you have an account set up and you utilize Partner World. If not, this is the link. Definitely bookmark this. Uh, but this is your one-stop shop for everything as an IBM business partner and ISV. Uh, we actually just redid Partner World, so it's got a new look. So if you haven't been there in a while, definitely go check it out. Bookmark that link. And there's a lot available uh, to you here on Partner World. Uh, including the new IBM My Digital Marketing tool. I wanted to make sure to take some time to tell you all about this new tool. This is what used to be the IBM DCM tool, if you're familiar with that. Uh, but basically, this is uh, one location for all, all your help needed with uh, digital marketing and marketing your solution. So in this tool, there is uh, you know, ready-to-use campaigns, events in a box, uh, content, and assets um, and guidance to help you uh, create a digital marketing strategy for your business. So definitely go check this out. If you need any help with this, uh, definitely reach out to me. I see here in the chat, uh, Allison shared my email and my Twitter, so very good. So please reach out to me if you need help with my digital marketing or anything else I've talked about so far. Yeah, and just some more uh, marketing systems available to you. You can apply for co-marketing funding uh, if you haven't done that, I definitely uh, uh, encourage you to do so. Uh, Co-marketing applications are available now for 2021, so definitely go in there and apply. Uh, can't, guarantee, can't guarantee anything of how you know, funding will be uh, distributed or anything like that, but definitely at least apply and to give yourself the best opportunity to receive co-marketing assistance for co-marketing funding for 2021. I'll also say everything I just mentioned, though, there's a lot available just outside of funding. So funding is not the only thing we can provide to you to help with your marketing as an ISV. Uh, there's a lot we can do that doesn't cost anything. So definitely keep that in mind. Uh, and I just mentioned co-marketing. So this is the page uh, within the Partner World site where you can apply, learn more about co-marketing and, and how, to, how to apply. This is a relatively new page that we just created as well. This is our Power Systems ISV Resource Center. So this is our page specifically for Power ISVs. The link is there at the bottom of the slide. Definitely bookmark this. Uh, but this is uh, everything, like this, the recording for this call today, our future webcast uh, assets uh, will all be on this page. So this is a great resource if you're a Power ISV. So definitely bookmark this page and check back often. Uh, you can also subscribe to our monthly ISP newsletter. Uh, Linda does a great job in putting that together and getting that on a monthly basis. So if you're not on that distribution list, I highly encourage you to, to get on there. And again, let me know if you need any help with getting on the distribution list or anything else. Again, I just mentioned this is our, our future call schedule and all the recordings. I believe the recording for this call today will be posted on here. So 
definitely register for future calls. Uh, the next one, I think uh, Gina mentioned at the beginning will be on Power 10. Uh, so that will be next month. So uh, definitely get registered for that one. And this is Seismic. Hopefully you're you already utilizing Seismic. If not, this is our sales enablement tool for IBM sellers and business partners and ISVs. Uh, if you have a Partner World account, you should be able to register. You should be able to access Seismic. Uh, again, let me know if you, you can't or need help getting in. But uh, this is also an entire library of marketing assets uh, and resources uh, for IBM I and the Power Systems portfolio. And this is, we have an IBM I page within Seismic. So everything you need for IBM I, all of our marketing assets, data sheets, client presentations, uh, seller enablement, is all on this page. And a little bit more about this page, this is the second half, as I mentioned. Also, all the content I mentioned earlier in this presentation is all linked there as well. And more on the, there's a lot here on the IBM I page. So, uh, we also have like a, a veto letter, uh, our external customer reference presentation that you can utilize, and uh, a link to that Gartner paper, uh, as I mentioned. And also, uh, we have a battle card for us versus Windows. So, I will say if you find yourself in a competitive situation, definitely utilize that battle card. So, this is uh, our IBM I Solution Edition. So, hopefully, you're familiar with this program as well. Um, this is also on, can be found from our IBM I landing page. Uh, but the Solution Edition is a great way to, to take advantage uh, and upgrade the Power 9. So, <clears throat> if you have a client who's already spending uh, a certain amount with you as a, a registered ISV, if you are registered in our Solution Edition program, uh, they can take advantage and register their new Power 9 server as a Solution Edition. And, and as part of that, they get a ton of uh, discounted and free software. They get lab services vouchers that can be used uh, also with a, a registered business partner. Um, so there's a lot to be to take advantage of. So definitely if you have a client thinking of upgrading their infrastructure, let them know about the solution edition. Uh, this is available for the Power9, S914, the four core and the six core. Uh, and we also just introduced the new S922 one core box also can be uh, utilized as a solution edition. So definitely take advantage of that. Uh, and just for the rest of this month, we have an offer called the Booster Pack. Uh, this is basically any ISV's purchase can qualify for a solution edition. So it doesn't have to be, the client doesn't have to acquire software or services from a, uh, a solution edition registered ISV. It can be from anyone uh, registered in partner world. So uh, let your client know about that. They also get uh, double the lab services vouchers. Uh, for the rest of this month. So only a couple weeks left to take advantage of the booster pack. We also have a seismic page for Powerline hardware uh, and our entire software portfolio as well. Um, the link there is at the, the bottom of the slide. Um, so if you need any resources on hardware specifically, they can all be found here on this seismic page as well. Uh, back on July 21st, we made an announcement for the Power Systems portfolio around our new cloud capabilities. Uh, is written up in Forbes, so hopefully you saw this. If not, there's the link. Definitely go read this article. Uh, Patrick Moorhead is a, a pretty well-known analyst in the community, so uh, he wrote a Forbes piece for us, which was great to see. Definitely go to that link, read that, and, and share that with your network. And Allison, do you want me to keep discussing this or? That would be fine or we can talk a little yeah, bit okay. about, yep, cool. you keep going. No problem, okay. <clears throat> so um, this is our, uh, we have a quarterly uh, call for our ISC Advisory Council. Um, the ISC Advisory Council is a, uh, a group we have made up of our IBMI ICs who meet with us regularly to provide feedback on our strategy and future roadmap, and we brief them on, on what we have planned for the platform. So uh, if you're interested in joining the IC Advisory Council, reach out to myself or Allison, and we can get you set up there. Uh, our next one, I believe, will meet again in November. Uh, we just wrapped up a meeting last week. So 
uh, definitely get involved if you're interested. Yep, great. And uh, we also have a monthly uh, IBM seller and business partner call. Um, the next one will be on October 22nd, or excuse me, we haven't done the one for September yet. So <laughs> the next one will be later this, this month. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in getting registered for those, the link is right there. Um, again, reach out to me if you need help. But um, this call uh, does require a, a non-disclosure agreement to be signed as we do disclose confidential information on our future strategy. But uh, definitely is another great way to keep up with what we're doing for the portfolio. And these are our fresh, this is our Fresh Faces program. So. Um, here is twice a year in IBM Systems Magazine is where we highlight uh, new and upcoming IT professionals working with not only IBM I, but power systems in general. Uh, our next class of Fresh Faces will be published uh, next month, so in Systems Magazine. So definitely look out for those. If you have a, a Fresh Face you'd like to nominate, um, somebody within your company or maybe that of a client or in the community, reach out to me and we can get them nominated uh, to be featured as a Fresh Face. We'd love to do that. I think at this point, this is Steve's picture. I think he'd like to tell a story about this. So Steve, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, so just a brief story. I know we're running a little past our hour, but hopefully you're finding this to be uh, useful. We tried to pack in as much as we could. Look, as it relates to Fresh Faces, you know that our passionate clients, the clients who love this platform, are always looking for reassurance that they're on the right platform. And one of the ways that we found to show that uh, they are on the right platform is to show them that they can hire people, fresh faces, who are um, able to come in and hit the ground running and do things on IBMI these days, and, and that encourages them. Well, we have a similar story related to our development community. I met uh, starting uh, two and a half years ago when Fresh Faces started as a program. I started meeting the Fresh Faces in the community, the clients and the partners who had hired young people who are very, very full of energy and lots of knowledge and wanted to, to make a difference in, in the community. So I came back to Rochester where our primary development site is and I asked if I could meet with the fresh faces, the young people that we've hired into IBM Y development. I didn't have any idea how big a group it was gonna be, but as you can see, we took a picture that day these are just the people who weren't on vacation that I invited. So you can see somewhere between 25 and 30 of them that had been recently hired into IBMI's development organization. I mean, that's a, uh, an example of the commitment that IBM has to the future of this platform. We, do, we hire these people because we know the platform has a long future and we need to have young developers coming in, learning how to be IBMI developers. Nobody can come in knowing everything that they need to know, but we take advantage of the skills that they have when they come in and we teach them new things. And by the way, a week from tomorrow, I have the next Fresh Faces in IBMI development uh, roundtable. We're going to have to do it virtually. And I have at least as many people as this joining me for that one. So we continue to uh, bolster the development team because we know that your business and your client's business, our shared client's business, depends on the future of this platform. And we're hiring people who will be the next, next generation of the development team here on this platform. So that's my story. I'll turn it over to Allison now to wrap things up. Great. Brandon, you want to just flip to the next chart, please? Perfect. So IBMI, as I said, really equals innovation, whether it's robotics, whether it's in the cloud, whether it's doing things like data analytics or data lookup, or whether it's pulling in weather or mapping information into applications. This is really, um, this is a really innovative platform. It's the platform that we rely on for our clients and our ISVs to build out new business value. And so um, I think our offer to you is Brandon walked you through all of those different options. I put a, my email address, I put Brandon's into the chat room. Please grab those if you have thoughts, ideas, if you want to get involved in a 
virtual briefing, please let us know. We're happy to help out. We think this is a great opportunity. Actually, it's turned out to be a very busy time for us doing um, virtual briefings. Works to everybody's advantage when we don't have to absorb travel time or cost into the briefing and we can simply tell you about the technology. Of course, we miss the face-to-face -face as we all, uh, we miss it as you do, but um, virtual will work. So I just want to appreciate, I just want to thank you and tell you how much we appreciate you spending the time with us and the fact that we do business with you and want to make that offer to you for us to help out at any time. Please remember to sign up for the next call on this series, which is on September the 24th on Power 10. Um, just to answer a couple of questions that have come up in the chat room, we do not have and will not publish dates for when Power 10 systems will be coming. Of course, we all know when we announce new chip technology, the systems aren't far behind, but we don't have any dates and won't be talking about those on September 24th either. But we will be telling you how we intend to use some of the Power 10 technology in the systems that we're building. So with that, I'm going to say thank you. Do I, uh, Jane or um, Gina, do you either of you want to say a few words or we're just going to wrap up and um, say thank you very much and thanks for hanging in. We're seven minutes over. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Allison. All right. Thank you, team. So as they said, Allison posted her email and uh, Brandon's email is in the notes as well. So do please make a note of that. Um, in the deck, you'll also find some helpful uh, links and charts. So do make sure you take the opportunity to download. Um, and including that link for the registration for the October, I mean, excuse me, September 24th event. So do make sure you download the deck. And with that, our session is complete. When you close, you will notice that there is a pop-up question with some surveys. Please do take a minute to fill those out for us so that we can better shape future events. Thank you so much for joining us. And with that, our session is complete. Click, you can click on the X at the bottom of your screen to close this event.